Cool. All right. Welcome back, coaches, to the Rugby WA Coaches Series. Uh, tonight we have a, a very experienced and, and respected coach in, in world rugby tonight in, in Gary Gold. So we're very lucky to have you, Gary, and, and welcome to the show. Um, Thanks for having me. No worries. Also, with that, we have Steve Anderson back again. And I'll ask Ando if you could come in and introduce Gary and then just give a little bit of history around um, or your history of Gary and, and a little bit about you used to as a, as a coaching vet. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dil. Uh, and once again, um, welcome, coaches. Um, very successful um, uh, last week with uh, Mike Byrne. Uh, thanks for your feedback. Uh, very much appreciated. And so is Mike. Um, and he'll be back in on the program in several weeks' time when we get out of the HP section. Uh, he's coming back onto the program, um, which is much appreciated. Uh, tonight, guys, obviously, we're, we're looking at analysis. Um, I'm not going to do too much of an intro on Gary. He's very well known. Um, obviously, I've had the privilege of working with Gary and an association for quite a long time. Um, but uh, what I will say is we're, we're bringing someone, once again, not only with international uh, experience of World Cup, uh, obviously provincial level with Super Rugby, um, and obviously also in uh, UK Premiership uh, with, with several leading clubs um, in England. Um, so <clears throat> a vast uh, resource of knowledge. Um, and as we can all attest, the, the longer um, we're in the game uh, at any level, uh, the more inclined we are to look introspectively and also externally at what are the influences on our <clears throat> on our performance and one of those areas and one of those uh, critical aspects is analysis um, so I'm not going to hold up uh, too much longer I've got some very we've done a, what, what I want to do is thank Gary uh, he's been on the line twice with us in terms of preparation for this session uh, so thanks very much Gary for that um, and very much looking forward to your presentation tonight um, so look, I'll hand you straight over, Gary. Um, and as Dylan said uh, for, for the audience, um, just be patient. Um, use the, the chat line and I'm sure Dylan will be able to manage uh, the questioning for Gary. Thanks very much, Gary. Over to you, mate. Thanks very much, Ando. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to many of you guys. I assume most of you are based in Australia. so. Thanks very much for the invite. Um, please excuse a few gremlins if we do have a couple of technical issues. I'll try and do this as smoothly as possible as, as I've rehearsed it. I think what I'm going to do is just before I share my screen is I'm going to turn my video off. That's okay, Dylan. Um, yeah, no just, uh, if, if I think if I turn that off, then uh, it's, uh, it's going to make it a little bit easier for me to, um, to present. So again, I just want to say, you know, thank you very much for the invite. Um, some great names on this call, um, some old friends, um, guys I worked with in Japan and, and uh, ex-players that I used to work with. So it's an amazing world, this, this, this rugby world. So it's, it's great to connect with all of you guys who, who I do know and, and uh, for those I haven't met, you know, um, I hope I can share just a small little bit of insight in terms of what I'm gonna do. In, in fact, actually, just as an introduction, what I am gonna say is, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of, of, of how we work with analysis or, or what my philosophy is around analysis um, and, and the value that I think it can bring to your organization, to players, to the development of players, and ultimately the development of the players leading to the team being more successful. I'm not saying my way is the correct way. I'm very open to any top, top type of questions you want to put through Dylan. Um, and, and please, you know, um, we, I know at the end of the conversation, we're going to talk about limitations that you may have in your organization about, I understand you may not all have the ability to have a drone or whatever the case may be, but I think in today's day and age, there are lots of um, opportunities in terms of um, how you can do analysis and give the feedback. So without further ado, I'm just going to turn the video off and I'm going to share my screen and we're going to crack on. So. Okay, guys, can you, uh, Dylan, I can see you. Can we, can you, can we see my screen at the moment? Um, let's no, try no. that. Okay, well, 
Who's the Kremlin? The Kremlin. There we go. How's that? There we go. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to crack on and uh, you just take you through what, how I've sort of term, term, termalized this is, is the value of analysis. I think it's really important that it's an interesting scenario because um, in the last 20 years of, of where we've been from a rugby point of view, it's, it's, it's been fascinating for me to see how this concept of analysis has changed. And some of the places that you know, I'll spend some time with, particularly if you use the USA as an organization where it's, a, it's still from a rugby professional point of view, and I mean professional as in the professionalism, not so much uh, necessarily paying to play, but in terms of the experience of, of running professional, professional rugby, I noticed that a lot of the time, particularly around analysis, the analysis is done because everyone else does it as opposed to having a real raison d'etre as to why you want to do analysis. And I'm, I'm sort of hoping that today, one of the things I'm, I'm able to, to um, impart with you guys is that, you know, I really want you to go away and think about why you're doing the analysis. There has to be an outcome of the analysis. So let's start off quickly and, and just ask, you know, really, what is analysis? What, what, what is performance analysis? You know, so what, what is the concept of, of, of performance analysis and what are you trying to, trying to get out of that particular analysis? And I think by asking, by answering what the what is, let's ask why we need to do performance analysis. So there's three things, there's three quotes that I think sum up the reason, in my opinion, uh, why we need um, analysis and, and what we need it for. The first one is a famous say, saying by Peter Drucker, which means if we can measure it, we can improve it. And I mean, I think the explanation is, is there, there in it. I think the dilemma that we have as coaches and, and the dilemma that the professional game and, and rugby now, you know, being professional since 96 or 97, um, still is uh, as a teenager going into early, early adolescence of a sport. I think with other sports that have been professional for a lot longer, there is a huge amount of responsibility on our shoulders as coaches. We have um, the welfare of players in our hands. You know, if we, select, if, we, if we recruit a player, if we select a player, if we do pick him or we don't pick him, understand how we have an effect on his earning capability and, and you know, dare I say it, without being too dramatic, even his lifestyle. So what is happening at the moment now is we're under pressure from players because players are going to ask the questions. They want to know why they're playing and why they're not playing, why they're selected, why they're going to be recruited or they're not going to be recruited. And conversely, we're under a huge amount of pressure as coaches because ultimately we have to win. We've got a, we've got a product that we have to put onto the field and we have to, we have to show results. So with those two in combination, um, I'm not sure how, how, A, fundamentally, you're going to develop players if you don't do some form of an ana analysis to understand where they are, how they need to improve, and, and, and then ultimately, from a team point of view, how you're going to do the same thing. And uh, I often talk about the story about how, how, how many of us as coaches have a player who we haven't necessarily picked, and the first conversation you're going to come and have with you is, you know, coach, what do I need to do to improve? And, and ultimately, you've got to give him the correct answer. Because if you're not going to do the analysis, he certainly probably will do. And he'll come back and challenge you on that. And then two more quotes as well, which I really like. This guy who knew a little bit about one or two things. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I think that's really, for me, I'll talk a little bit in a moment about analysis paralysis. I think, again, don't do the analysis because everybody else is doing it. Do it because it's going to directly uh, respond to, to your organization and the improvement of your organization. And then, um, and then uh, this, this is probably the quote I, I, I enjoy the most. Um, and it's there for everybody to read. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so opinions are what we know that opinions are. So create a learning environment. I think that's fundamentally one of the, one of the biggest reasons why. We want to create a learning environment. And in a learning environment, we have, we have um, the three biggest aspects that we have is, is our, our, our hearing and what we're telling people, uh, which is what's going on at the moment now, but hence the reason why I'm using visual aid as well. It's the feely, touchy sense that we're talking about. And then obviously it's the visual sense in terms of the education. 
So again, you do the analysis, not only because you want to get the data and you want the information, but also from a learning point of view and being able to educate visually, it has such an, a, a powerful effect. And then in the education space, I mean, this is just a little bit of a, um, a detail around the vision that the eyes can register 36,000 visual messages per hour and visuals are processed 60,000 times faster than text. So it's really important that the message, the, the sales pitch, if you want to, is really important around the education, okay? And, and the visuals um, trigger the emotions. I just want to try while I've got you, just excuse me for a second. This, I want to just try and get rid of that. There we go. Okay. Sorry, I had something on my screen. I wasn't sure if you guys could see. Okay, so as I've mentioned before, just go back to the slide. Visuals trigger the emotions, align recreation of the experience. So I think it's really important to understand how visually it is important that when you do the analysis, how you how you show it back to the players and how they are, are, are able to, to be able to process that. And then of course, clarity and confidence. Again, Einstein's theory early on about keeping it simple, you know, and getting the message across in the most succinct way. But it's also about giving your players clarity and confidence, clarity of their role, clarity of the expectations and confidence to be able to go out and do the job. When there's clarity, when there's simplicity in what, you, what you're doing, it, it does breed confidence. Okay, so how, how do we go about doing this? And I'm just going to share some pieces of information. I'm going to get through these initial slides quickly because I'd like to deal with a little bit of the processes and the stuff that we that we use or stuff that I've basically developed for myself over a number of years. And by keep asking myself the same question about how can it improve the team performance and ultimately how am I able to develop players in terms of them being able to get better. So from a match day point of view, um, we're in a privileged situation because we get if we get television views and many of you guys will have more than one view, many of you will not, but we really try and work with, with four views if we possibly can, just so that we can get the ultimate um, package in, in terms of that we're gonna see a wide view, we're gonna see a tight view, Ideally, we try and see an end on view and then we try and we'll just get a, a pretty much of a broadcast view. Again, the broadcast view can help you um, at certain times and other times when they do cutaways and that can be a bit of a problem. So it's always good to try and have some other views that try and help you. That's what we pretty much do on match day. And then from a training point of view, again, you can see a while, the reason I wanted to use this, this picture over here is because you can see right in the middle view was a drone, but the other two views are just literally our medical staff holding cell phones and cameras and just viewing what you had over there. So again, just trying to get the different angles. This in particular, the scrum, it is important to see what's going on both sides of the scrum. So we had a camera on either side of the scrum and it's easier to review. This stuff in today's day and age is really, really easy. The quality of the footage from the phones is really good. You can get gimbals, you can get um, uh, mechanisms where you can hold the phone and it's really steady. And it's really good quality of footage that you can get, obviously, in landscape or in, in, in a wider view, should you choose to do that. So that's what we try and do from a training point of view. Um, and obviously, then, if you are lucky enough to have drones, which, you know, every day and every month at the moment, you know, the drones are coming down in price and becoming a little bit more affordable. But this is obviously a view that, you know, a handful of years ago was, was practically impossible unless you were building three or four foot towers and they weren't very movable. So this is a very handy view for you to get. So that's pretty much an overview in terms of what we're looking to do. So that's pretty much the footage, et cetera, et cetera. I want to get into a little bit of detail now, the key elements of video analysis. This is pretty much summed up. I'll take you through these points and then I'm going to go through the team and the individuals a little bit quicker because you'll have this as a recording. You can always refer back to it. I don't necessarily want this to be something where you're just reading script the whole time. So my, my most important um, couple of points I want to make up front. T today, we're only going to refer to the, ob the object of doing your own video analysis. Obviously, everything we're talking about can also and should also be done on the opposition. Again, due to my next point, be, care be aware of analysis paralysis. I have often seen... Um, really, really studious rugby environments with really smart guys who want to, who've got fantastic work ethics and put huge amount of work into doing opposition analysis. 
Um, the data that they get, the information that they get is incredible. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic. Um, and there's quite, quite a bit of good science on this at the moment now. Is, is it's really interesting to, and, 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 and it's a bit of a warning as well, is be, be careful on the amount of information that you do on the opposition analysis to the detriment of your own analysis. Now, what does that mean? It depends on the environment that you're in, but if you're in a slower moving environment like a Rugby World Cup, and you're going into a Rugby World Cup and you're 12, uh, six, three months out from Rugby World Cup and you know who the teams are in your pool, then, then you can fill your boots. Then it's not a problem. You can, we did it, um, didn't help us much, but we did it. We gained huge amount of knowledge on every one of the other teams in our pool. And we took in excess of a year's worth of information. We did data analysis on it. And we did as much uh, thorough information as we could because time was on our side. When you're in a competition like Super Rugby or in club rugby, local club rugby, and the competition is coming thick and fast and it's week in and week out, my suggestion to you on the opposition analysis is get headline. Get headline pieces of information, understand what makes them tick. And what we, what we did and we found was very, very useful is from a processing point of view for your players is sum up the opposition in no more than one page. Have three or four headline acts. What are they about? What is their DNA? What, 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 what floats their boat? What do they want to be trying to do in the rugby field? And if you were to stop that, what's the most, what, are the, what are the top three things that you've got to do to be able to stop them? And that should account for no more than 20% of your time on analysis. On analysis, not in the week, just on analysis. And then 80% of your time on your own analysis. Because ultimately, ultimately the game is about what you want to do and how you want to affect the game. And you always want to be improving. And I just feel that a lot of the time, again, I don't say it's a box ticking exercise, but it's done because as a coach, you almost feel you have to justify yourself and therefore do all this analysis. And I think it's actually become a bit of an art to be able to do opposition analysis in a succinct way where you're really, really sharp and you know that you're getting your headline message across. There's also lots of studies about how much information your players can take in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a particular period of time and, and being the week that you're looking to do your own stuff. So be care, beware of analysis paralysis. Um, even though I'm going to share quite a lot of information with you today, I still think that it's knowledgeable for us as coaches to have that information. Where the, where, where the real skill comes into it and the art comes into it is that you're only going to deliver the most important information to the players that can affect them in the team environment versus the individual environment. And they're two very different environments. On a, in a one-on-one -on -one environment, you can obviously go into a lot more detail because you're talking specifically to the player and about his, his actions. In the team environment, also not too dissimilar to the opposition information, keep the headlines short and simple. Said about developing a list of information, stats. I don't like the word stats. I can't get away from it. I, I prefer the word facts. Uh, I know there's this misconception of uh, uh, lies, more lies and statistics. It, it shouldn't be a statistic. It should be a touchy, feely fact of what the individual does in the rugby field. If you can measure it, if you can see it, if you can see the action and if you can improve it, that's a fact. And that's all you should be uh, wanting to spend our time doing. So I think that you need to feel you will consistently need so that you can monitor your team and individual performance to the standards that you set. The standards that you said we're going to touch on in a little bit as well. Because again, you have to have some form of a goal or in the, in, in, in the terminology we're going to use is the KPIs and the target around the KPIs. Have some form of a goal in terms of what you want your team to look like, the way you want to play the game, and how you're going to measure those outcomes, and so as to achieve the levels of excellence that you desire. Make a conscious effort to identify the stats or the facts that directly tie into the elements of the game that you feel are most important for your team to function effectively. And I'll show you a demonstration of that later. That can change, guys. That can change. That can change because of the makeup of the players in your team. Again, use the example, if you happen to be a coach that wants to play very much of a ball in hand type of game, and you want to play that from every um, area of the field, that's fine. You do need the players who can be able to, 
to, to do that. And then you need to ensure that your coaching week and the focus points are very much focused towards that type of a game plan. Similarly, if you want to play a, a strong forward orientated game, because that's the type of pack that you've got, and you want to play a strong territorial base, and you've got a kicking game that you, you, you think could, could, could give you good dividends because you've done research and you think that that works, you have to ensure that you've got the players who can do that. And then obviously, uh, you have to tie that into the fact that that's what you're doing during the course of the week. Once you've identified this relevant information, it's vital that the goals are set for each player specifically, and that they have a clear idea of what is statistically expected of them by the coach, by your coaches. So is he an elite ball carrier? That's the reason why you picked him. Um, do you not necessarily want him carrying that often, but you really want him to be able to hit anything between 15 and 20 rucks a game? You know, then those are some of the goals that you want to set for him in terms of him understanding what your expectations are of, of the individual. And then stats are devised from veneer analysis by no means an exact science. I, I, I put that in there because I read a paper last week um, done by two university students in the UK. I won't mention the university or the club they're referring to. But it was an article that was written in The Guardian this year, 2020. And it was saying that um, video analysis is, is stumping the creativity of players and players aren't allowed to think on their feet. And so I, I sort of put this in there to try and get the point across is this is not rugby by numbers. Uh, guys, please, there's a distinct difference. I'm not necessarily saying to you, you can't ever carry a ball and you've only been picked for cleaning. That's not at all what we're saying. We're saying certain players, whether we like this fact or not, this is a scientific fact, certain players that you pick in your team, you pick for a skill set that they have. That's why you pick them. If he's 80 kilograms and he kicks the G off the Gilbert, that, and, he runs, and he, he, he runs a 10 in, in 11 and a half seconds, 100 in 11 and a half seconds, there's a reason why you've picked him. You're not picking him to be your offensive tackler. You're picking him to be your playmaking team. Just make sure that he understands what your expectations are of him. And that's the reason why we want to build some form of analysis around the individual. So that he or she, in their specific environment, can improve to the very best of their ability by the standards that you want. For, and that's the reason why you're picking the individual. So I say that it's not an exact science. I would like it to be an exact science in the particular information that you're sharing with them. It should be an exact science, but it's not. Because, of course... Can you always measure decision-making? I would debate yes, but the fact of the matter is sometimes, and most of the time, a lot of the time, you do want to give the players the freedom to play and make decisions in front of them and give them the ability to run or kick when they think that that's the right opportunity. Of course, I'm not saying take that away from them. Although, but what I am saying in terms of when it's not exact science, the accuracy of the data and the, the, the statistics that, and the facts that you're going to be sharing with the players has to be of, of paramount accuracy. That's critical because obviously this whole thing falls down and there's no value in it if, there's not, if, 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 if the, the information is not accurate. But they definitely are an effective tool to monitor individual and team performances. I think maybe in summation of this slide and when we talk about stats or facts or the information you're going to give the player, see it as a tool. See it as a tool if, if, if you don't necessarily like dealing with facts, and a lot of people who, who are right brain orientated and very creative don't like dealing in, in stats and facts. And, you know, um, again, the science will tell us that there are coaches who are a hell of a lot more creative and don't like to deal in, 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 in stats. Then just see it as a tool to guide you in terms of seeing uh, and understanding that you are achieving what you're trying to achieve. Okay, so this is all going to come up at once because I don't necessarily want to go through it, but they, it's just an example. I've, bro I've broken the information into two main groups, in the individual fundamental statistics, so um, pieces of information that, that pertain to the individual players, and then the effectiveness of team plays. So what are you trying to do? You will go away and devise a play, inevitably, and that play, in your mind as a coach, you'll have an outcome. Therefore, stipulate that outcome. Understand what you're trying to do there and then go back and measure if you've been effective in that. So it's the stat that applies to the effectiveness of the players that are executed by the team or the, uh, the, the, the relevant groups. So it could uh, be your objectives with your lineouts because of the type of ball you want to win. 
you've got a very clear objective in terms of what you want to do for a line out, measure it. Measure it and see if you were successful in terms of what you wanted to do. Um, and these are obviously stats done on offensive and defensive players as well. Okay, so this is where the whole thing is going to come up at once. Again, I'm not going to go through it. It's just, it's an, it's an example. Again, you can go into a huge amount of detail or you can just keep it at headline stats. Again, if you don't have the resources and you don't have outstanding software um, and you want to keep it limited, if you literally just looked at the ability to carry effectively, the ability to be effective at, at the breakdown, in other words, are you a good support runner? Did you offer an offload line? If you didn't, were you effective in terms of getting to the breakdown first or second? Did you move the threat away effectively? And then your tackle information, you know, therein you'll have a heap of information as well. You can go into a lot of more detail about was he first arrive, second, third, fourth, or fifth, was he effective in every one of those areas? You can go into that. But again, it does, you are limited by the, um, uh, the tools that you have. Just as a matter of interest, when Ando and I worked together well, nearly 20 years ago, I was still literally on a Sunday night after we played, I would go back to this little porter cabin we had, old VHS machine, and literally on a spreadsheet with a pencil that I used to sharpen underneath the table, literally fill in a dot for every, every time I fast forwarded or rewinded um, the, 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 the film on, on, on the team. And it's, it's an amazing learning curve. It's ama it takes hours and hours to do, but you, you, you blow, you'll blow your mind in terms of how much you see on the individual. Okay, so here is an example. Um, this is just a, a PDF shot. I'm going to show it to you live in a second. But this is, this is the headline on a particular player. This is actually the player's name, believe it or not. Sam Wuchin is his name. Um, it's not a verse of a Bible that I'm sharing with you. So this is actually a player. And you can see in one page, I can sit with him and I can have a look at his ball carries on the left-hand side, uh, all under his uh, uh, attack information, his breakdown information on the right-hand side, his defensive information. Um, BRG is back in the game. It's an important aspect for us. So he had on attack, he had uh, 29 opportunities to get back into the game. 27 of the time he was effective and twice he wasn't, similarly uh, defensively. And then the four areas, the headline pieces of information, giving him a clear message in terms of where we want is, we have goals in terms of dominance of his carry. We have goals in terms of his accuracy at the breakdown. We have goals in terms of his dominance of his tackle, and we have goals in terms of his tackle completion. And he's red or green. It's as simple as that. If he hit the goal, he's green. If he didn't, he's, he's, he's red. And I'll touch on it in a moment where we got that information from. And then I'll show, and then underneath you can see how he's comparing to the team. And then he set piece contributions as well. And then from that, at the end of a campaign in international rugby, but you can do it uh, on a regular basis whether you're at club rugby. We'll take on the left-hand side is his information. And this is something that I developed um, quite a while ago, interestingly enough, in that article that I mentioned to you in The Guardian earlier, that scientific piece of information. This particular thing that I developed a handful of years ago called the Work Efficiency Index um, got quite heavily criticized in there, saying that uh, we were trying to make robots out of the players. And again, I think unless you're on the ground and, and you understand what the objective is, the, the fundamental objective is to improve the rugby player. That's it. That's the start and the finish of it. I'm just trying to use a tool to improve a rugby player. So what we've got over here is we've got Sam and his individual's contributions, pretty much the same stuff you saw on the page before, but this is the end of a campaign. So how many total contributions did he have? What was that as an average per game that he played? How many physical positive contributions did he make to the team? And that um, ended up being at 77 Point three percent okay what is his work efficiency index that's just a that's just a, um, a formula that we use and then what was his work rate and then I compare that to the same people who played in the same position to him on the right hand side and we do a comparison between where he was his work efficiency is slightly below the average and his work rate was slightly below the average and then at the bottom I just give him a little bit of um, after we've done all our one-on-ones and what we've spoken to him about and I'll give him a little bit of an RDP over there, which we will then expand into more detail um, in a full sheet of strengths, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities for him to become a better rugby player that he can take back to his club and it's shared, it's shared with his club coaches and his strength and conditioning coaches as well. 
but that's the end of a four or five match campaign and you can see where we found that he's, he's been successful or he hasn't been successful. Okay, so at this particular moment, I'm going to break away and I'm going to show you three pieces of, of, of ways of doing individual analysis and what kind of um, stuff we had to look at. So um, if you just bear with me, I hope this is where the gremlins don't come in. So the first thing that I'm going to show you is this is something that we designed um, and this is a very sensitive website. It's a live website, so I'm hoping it's going to work. I'm just going to click on Alan McGinty. He's one of our players. Yeah, I'm just going to have to log in again. Sorry, guys. I hope it doesn't take too long. So this is something. It's an online portal. And what happens is we have the ability where the information is fed into this as a database from all professional rugby that these guys participate in around the world. So Alan McGinty, AJ McGinty is our fly half. There, when I click on his name, you can see for this period of time, and I won't go into details of that because we bore you too much, but this period of time, this is how AJ is faring. He's in, in, the, in the game time that we have for him, that's what his contributions are. And then I can do a comparison, which is a standard um, template, and the template will say to me, we're going to compare him to players in focus. So players in focus mean all the other tens within our group. Uh, then what we call the elite players. So what we've done with the elite players is really interesting is we have taken um, the competitions that AJ has played in. So AJ plays for sale in, in, in England in the premiership. And we've taken other fly halves who are playing premiership rugby. And AJ plays fly half for the USA in the American Rugby Championship. So there's no real point in me comparing him to Bowden Barrett who's playing in the rugby championship, which with respect, is a much better level of competition. So I will, I will rather compare, I will select in the elite players, I will select um, um, maybe compare him to the Canadian team, or I'll compare him to the 10 that plays for Argentina in the American Rugby Championship, so that I'm getting a like for like, and then the last comparison is pretty straightforward. It's every player in the database. And that lends to issues around work rate. And you can see that we have a comparison. So why do I do this? Why do we do this? The fundamental reason, again, is to get a mean average. For us just to get an idea in terms of how effective is AJ being in the things that he does. And we can go into a lot more detail, and I'll show you in a second when we do go into the detail of what he, what he does. So for the pieces of information that we, are, that we are gathering on AJ as a player, to hopefully make him a better player, let's compare him to the masses. Because it's one thing for me to say, I'm going to have a goal, and I'll tell you in a moment when we, get to the, when we get to the team goals, how we got there. But when we have a team goal, um, it, it's fine that you got there, but ultimately, if you're above average, or you are one of the, the best ones in, in the group that we're selecting, you're doing pretty darn well. Okay, so this, this helps us build a profile when he says to me that infamous sentence that he comes along and he says, coach, what I, do, what I need to do to improve, you can sit down, understand, and you can go through this with him. Understand the accountability works both ways. So if I am going to use this information and I'm going to use it as a guideline and I'm stressing as a guideline because the character of the individual is still, in my humble opinion, still of critical importance so I am very comfortable at times to maybe not necessarily pick the best player, but understand we're talking about the value of analysis in terms of developing a player. We're not talking about using analysis as a tool to select the team or, 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 or potentially even to, to, um, to um, recruit a player. If his character is dodgy and he's not a great guy and he's not good for the team environment, but he shoots lights out, you've got a decision to make in your organization about whether you want that individual. We are just fundamentally talking about the value of uh, analysis today. So this is the one way we can look at it. And then um, I do have an, uh, an ability, this is determined by the type of competition that you're playing in. Unfortunately, some of the data that we get of some of these guys, so maybe I'll give you an example. Maybe we're comparing him to the Canadian 10, but he's playing in Pro de Deux in France, and I don't have um, what we call pro codes. Um, this is from Stats Perform. I mean, I'm not really having any secrets here. I'm always happy to share that. So the data I get from this organization called Stats Perform. But because I can't compare like with like, 
if I turn the pro code on over here, um, yeah, this is very sensitive. Sorry, guys. Just it crash it sends me out quite quickly. I apologize. Let me just refresh this. So I'll talk while I'm refreshing it. Um, what it will do is it gives me, it, it, it just changes the, the comparison um, uh, a little bit more and it gives me like versus like. So it'll give me only against fly halves who are playing in the premiership. I'll come back to that in a second. Right, so what I want to do here is, here's the list of all the players that we have the access to that information. And again, we're just trying to create a format for for, for this player, for him to understand how we can help him and how he can develop him. So let's say um, what I want to do now is I want to sit with a player and he wants to understand how we can compare him against other players in the world. So the player that I'm going to select today is our lock and his name is Nate Brakely. And I'm going to select Nate over here. And then we're going to sit down and again, common sense is, is you know, we know who are very good players in the world and we're going to uh, I'm going to look at um, him against Courtney Laws, and I'm also going to compare him to um, Sam Whitelock. Samuel Whitelock. Okay. And when I have a look at that filter, it tells me, I beg your pardon, I just want to show you this. It shows me that Courtney has also played back row. So we don't want to see Courtney as a back row. We only want to see his role as a lock. We have a look at it as a lock. It simplifies it for me. And that now I can, I now can have a look at a comparison of these two players. Now, in his in individual development program, this is one of the things that we can use. I will empower the player to say, who do you think, and again, I say this with respect, obviously at this moment in time, the coaching in America, the game hasn't uh, shot lights out there yet. We're certainly not a world force. So a lot of our players are wanting to aspire to the best players in the world and understand what that looks like. And I'll take you through this very briefly. So again, I just want to compare that we're comparing like for like. You know, the one guy hasn't played 12 games versus one and a half games. And often that is the case. Uh, and, and then you can just go through the individual pieces of information. So this is information around his ball carries. Again, I can see what his work rate is like. How many times does he carry? So in this case, Nate is not a big carrier in the team that he plays for. And this could be his MLR, he plays for New York. So it could be his contributions when he's playing for New York, but it's also his, his international contributions. So he doesn't carry very often where Courtney Laws is a big carrier. And again, for those of us who know Courtney, you understand that's one of the reasons why he's been picked. Hence the reason he can play back row. His dominant carry percentage is at 43. Nates is reasonably good. It's very little numbers, but it's at 33. But interestingly enough, when we go a little bit further down the line, you can see his presentation, how well he presents the ball. Um, how well they pass the ball, um, do they have an offload game, how effective is their offload game, and that, that speaks to decision-making as well. How good is he around the breakdown, and what's, he work here? what's his work rate like here? Interestingly enough, Nate's got a much higher work rate. Well, big your pardon. He cleans a lot more rucks than what Courtney does in a game. So again, Courtney's game is very much more around the balance between him carrying and hitting breakdowns, Whereas Nate's game is less about the carrying and more about hitting breakdowns. He's a four lock. You could argue that Courtney's a five lock. And so you'd probably use him in a slightly different way. Interestingly enough, when we do the analysis with him, we have a look at the amount of attacking breakdowns that he hits. It's a good number. He's very, very good as the first arrivee. Second arrivee's numbers are good. Third is still quite high as a percentage. I'd want to have a look at that. And I'd really want to have a look at why is the fourth arrivee so, so often because 11 is still quite a high number. And that could, when we then have a look at the footage on that, I could then lean back and, 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 and sit with him and say, did you necessarily need to, to be the fourth arrivee that regularly at a breakdown? Because probably the breakdown's lost at that stage or you're in a world of trouble. That's the information around his tackles. I don't want to bore you with all the information. It's more about just showing you the principle of how we can sit. Again, comparatively, from a dominant tackle point of view, he's very low. So again, from his IDP, that would be an area we'd work on. Knowing Nate the way I do, he has the ability to be a big hitter. He's, he's a big, strong guy. He moves well for a front lock. He's not a cumbersome guy. He's not extraordinarily heavy. He's probably about 118. Um, and um, he has the ability. He's, he's, he's powerful. So it's definitely an area we could work on. And we would put that into his RDP in terms of increasing his dominant tackles. 
really hoping that you don't see too many kicks in there for the locks. And there's some work information about his line out delivery, some really interesting information about does he concede turnovers and penalties? Because you, you don't want that to be, um, you want the turnovers and penalties that he creates um, to outnumber the turnovers and penalties that he, he concedes. That's very important information for loose forwards, particularly good open sides. Um, I remember working with Francois Lowe for a long period of time, both in, at Western Province and at Bath, where we worked together um, a long period of time. And Francois worked really, really hard at, he was outstandingly effective over the ball. But interestingly enough, in his early days, he gave two, more, twice as many penalties away as the penalties that he won. So there's a big decision-making element around him going to the breakdown. He was certainly brave enough and tough enough but he was literally diving into everything. And, and actually, statistically, he, he was more of a hindrance to the team. And over the years, it's probably one of the areas that he's worked on the hardest to, to improve because of the data that we had where I could show him and show him the clips and say, Flo, for every 10 breakdowns that you, 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 you're going to, you know, you're conceding six penalties and you're only really winning three. You're only winning three, you know, so or getting three turnovers. So, again, it was getting that proportion right without wanting to stifle his enthusiasm to go and break down. And then that's the totals. That's what the totals looks like and, and actually what we have, have a look at. And then just from, an, from a Major League Rugby point of view, and this is now speaking a lot more towards um, the actual players within the Eagles group, we, have a, we, we take that information, we import it bespokely just for the Major League competition. So this is only one competition where you're comparing like versus like 100%. Um, this is everybody who's playing in the competition. And then the guys that are, um, that are our players, we will do a scorecard like this where the information is just important. It's exactly the same information you've seen from the dashboard or what is out there. We just give this in a one screenshot that we can share at any time with the player. And then the headline pieces of information are, that's what his work efficiency is. That's what his positive contributions are. That's what his work rate is. And where does he feature in terms of the averages? So he's 2.15% ahead of the average, just over the average over there and quite significantly over the average over there. And then if, he, if we were to want to do a head-to-head, -head, we've got the ability to take the two players and compare them. And then we can see the comparison there in the spider chart. And then over here, the comparisons by speed dials. It's just, again, very, very aware that I don't want to be um, throwing just spreadsheets and numbers and words at the players. I want to make it visually appealing for them so that they can understand it. And then there's um, some other significant information that we use as well there. Okay, so that's the piece of information. Oh, beg your pardon. That's the piece of information I wanted to share with you now. And then, um, again, uh, if I may, just the last thing that I'll show you. Um, many of you have worked with us. Um, this is a this is that dashboard that I showed you as a PDF. This is it live. Um, I just lost my cursor. I'll just try and find it back now. There we are. So this is a game in the background. These are these windows that are live. And uh, again, when I'm sitting in a one-on-one -on -one and I want to go through these dominant tackles, if you pardon go through his dominant tackles before i've shared it with him i can have a look at this boom there's his tackle he stops him in the game line there's his next tackle and there's his third tackle and it's easy for us to take him through that so this is live and interactive the whole time with the player as well from the games that we go through. So at any time we'd be in a, in a position to be able to give him feedback. Okay, I'm just gonna stop for a second and see Dylan if there are any questions before we move on to the next, which is the team environment. Yeah, Gary, we have um, DJ, do you just wanna unmute yours and, and go through your question? There's uh, two other questions after that, Gary. DJ, do you just wanna unmute, mate? Sorry about that. Here you are. Thank you. Hey Gary, good to, good to hear you tonight, mate. Thank you very much for doing this. My pleasure, my man. Okay, the question I have for you is, um, are you kind of set on number specific for targets? Are you with more broad focus um, in reward the player being effective in a game? Um, with number of targets is set, but they don't lend, the game doesn't lend the player to reach targets. 
Um, but the players being more effective in other parts of the game rather than the targets you set from. How do you communicate that to the player after the game? Is it true a positive or a negative? And then do you reassess their individual goals? I'll answer the last part of your question first. For, for me, personally, it's just my, my opinion. E everything for me, I would like to try and keep on the positive. Again, I have, I, have, I have this theory, and that is that if, a, if an individual, I'm sorry I don't have a whiteboard here, but if, if this is the individual's strength and the reason you're picking him, and let's say if you were to give it a number, let's just give a fictitious number, and he's functioning at 80% is effective, and, um, and, and that could be he's a blindside flanker and he's a very good ball carrier, um, and there's an element of his game which is a weakness. I can't think of one off the top of my head. His kicking game, which I, I would hope a blind side flank has got a poor kicking game. And that's functioning at 30%. If I put the same time and energy into improving him and making him an elite athlete, and I improve him, let's say, by a number of 10%, I'll move this to 88% and I'll move this to 33% by putting the same time and energy into him. So that's the reason why, to answer your question, for me, it's fundamentally about taking what I call his super strengths. There's a reason, there's a point of difference. There's a point of difference why he's in your team and you've picked him above many other players that are in that position. Focus time and energy on to getting th those areas up to speed. Of course, I would spend time on working his weaknesses, but I would. there's a reason why he's in your team and that's the area that I want to focus on. So that's answering your first question. The second part of the question, which is the first thing that you asked me, DJ, in the beginning is, um, what happens if the numbers that I'm talking about don't necessarily correspond to his game? The numbers that I'm talking about, we're going to talk about it in a second now when we, when we start referring to the, the team numbers, which is the overall makeup on how, do we, how are we going to play the game where ultimately, ultimately the bottom line is how, how are we going to be able to win more games than we lose? That's ultimately what we're all in this for. We love the game. We want to play a really good brand of rugby, but many of us over here actually want to win as well. So where do you get that balance right? How do, how do we make that work? So my, I suppose my answer to your question is, I would bespoke those criteria for the individuals specifically and for the position that he plays in. Because it's very important for me that, you know, the role that we want our Tate to do is significant on the rugby field is going to be significantly different to the role that we want our nine or our 10 to do. So, of course, the, the individual development programs and what we want from that individual are going to be bespoke very, very differently in terms of what we want. And so... I would have that conversation with an individual about what is his super strength and is he bringing that to the party? And that may, that may quite literally, um, in the case of a wing, it might be one point of difference, but it's so significant, it could be his pace and his ability to, you know, to beat individuals one-on-one. -on -one. And that may be the reason why he's in the team because he, he just has that X factor. But I would bespoke it specifically to him to make sure that he, he's getting the best out of, out of, uh, out of himself and, and contributing to your team. I hope that does that uh, answer your question. Yep, yeah, there there about the the um, around the effectiveness around outside of his targets. So if he's not being effective in what you said, so we'll say we'll take a prop, your tight head prop, and the scrum is an open, or the he's uh, you've set targets within the scrum, or you set targets within breakdowns, but the game is an open game, and there isn't many scrums or reset scrums then how do you translate that into goals for the guy if he's doing more uh, offloads, um, but it's not a target you set from in the game? Again, you have to determine of how the game's gone. I mean, literally, if they only have three attacking scrums in the whole game, I mean, again, you can't penalise the guy because they've only had three scrums. But if they've only had three scrums, it's going to be a pretty open game. So there's probably going to be twice as many phases of play that, that, that he's had, and you will have a goal for him in his phase play. Now, whether that's on attack in terms of what his support line is, if you're using a pod system, and then you can evaluate that and see how effective it is with that. And if you don't have the ball and it's defending, you'll see that he understands his role in defense. Does he recycle well? Does he fold well? Does he recognize where the, where the threat is? Does he get around the corner? That'll be part of his goal. And then the third aspect of it is in the transition play between the kicking game and or losing the ball or turning out turning over the ball, whether you turn it over, they turn it over, is he understanding his role in the transition really well? Does he understand that we've gone into a kick game? Does he understand what his role is? Where does he migrate? 
Does he fill, fill the field? Does he talk well? Is his chase lines good? So in every one of those aspects, there will be goals that pertain to him. If he doesn't achieve them from a scrum point of view on that particular day, that's not his fault. Again, um, depending on the system you want to play, a lot of, you know, the old, some guys used to use a 242 system. I'm not a big one in terms of giving these systems names, but a 242 system versus a 1331 system or whatever you're using. And then, you know, your 242 system, I used to have loose forwards come to me and go, well, I'm never getting the ball. How, how, how can you penalize me if I'm not carrying, if I'm never use, using the ball in that situation? And you do have to answer those questions. They are relevant questions. You can't tell a loose forward to go and stand on the wing and the ball never ever gets there. So, but, but then fundamentally, if that's the system you want to use and the ball's not getting there, there is something broken with your system. Either your system's the wrong system or you're not, you don't have the, you, you're not executing it well enough because clearly you're not going to be putting one of your elite ball carriers in the wing, asking him to be car carrying in excess of 10 carries in a game and the ball doesn't get there. Something's then broken. And again, r really why I like your question is because that's what it's always got to go back to. It's got to go back to answering that question. It's not just about ticking the box and it's a stat and, oh, he did or he didn't achieve it. If he's coming to you afterwards and go, I had three ball carries in the game. Why are you putting me on the bloody wing? There's a problem with your system. And again, hopefully that's just another one of the fundamentals that you can look at to go back and, 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 and re-look re at your system and say why it is or it isn't working. So if it was a case like that, the ball could not be getting away from the two middle pods for some reason. Your playmakers aren't getting away or they're poor decisions being made. And that should then get you back to being able to sort out what the, what the solution is going forward. Awesome, Gary. Thanks for that, Mitch. Stay safe. Only a pleasure. You too. Gary, I'll just bring in Christian. One of the other uh, questions got answered pretty much in, in your description there. So I'll bring in Tej now. Off you go, mate. You're off you. Hey, Stellan. Yeah, hi, Gary. Uh, hey, hi. So, Gary, um, has there been an instance where the stats have gone against a player, uh, potentially a number of games consistently? Um, however, you've gone with your gut feeling against, you know, debate with your assistants um, to retain the player, you know, for the following week's game. Have you gone with your gut feeling against the statistics? Hell yeah. Yes, definitely. Very good example. Strong leadership ability. Very strong leadership ability. And again, he's not necessarily hitting the goal as well as maybe somebody else is, but the, the difference between where he's falling short from a playing point of view is not actually significantly affecting the performance of the team enough, but the value that he adds, say, in his leadership, that's just one example I'm giving you, his leadership far outweighs uh, the value that he brings to the team and the confidence that he gives to the players around. And that's the reason why um, I'm at pains to say it's a tool, it's a guide. It's a guide in facts. But, and, and if you've got those facts, you can have the conversation with the player you're not picking and, and, and then just have the conversation and say, yes, yeah, statistically, you are playing really well. You're delivering what we want you to deliver. But Joe if he's, that's his name, we are selecting him because of his leadership ability. And just be honest with the player. Tell them the reason why they are in the team. But yes, we do use that. Again, it's just a tool, it's just a guideline for me to make that decision. But if I make that decision, I, I have to give that same feedback back to the guy who's not playing and say to him, you are doing what we're asking you to do, but here's the reasons why we're making that decision. And ultimately, we're entitled to that. We're still entitled to do that because as a coach, We've got to make that decision for, hopefully, what's the best thing for the team. And it very well may be the best thing for the team. Again, that very famous old quote from the hockey coach in, 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 the, in the 1980s, you know, often I'm not looking for the best player, I'm looking for the right player. The right player might be, you know, it, 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 you know, it, it, it might be that he's got a skill set that, that, you know, you can't statistically analyze, like leadership is a very good example. Often you'll find that the skill set could also be different. So I'll give you a very good example. An outstanding five lock who calls the line out. You have to make a decision about how valuable it is for you to be winning in excess of 85% of your line outs. And I see Nathan's on the call and I mean, he could attest to this as well. Again, when you understand that such a large amount of tries come from line outs, it, it, it's, it's, the, it's the highest form, it's, it's the highest element of where tries come from. So therefore, the line-out is a significantly important 
element in the game. And there's about on average 17 lineouts in the game. Now, if you've got a five lock who calls the line out exceptionally well, and you can pretty much tick the box that you're going to have an outstanding lineup that functions really well, whether that's defensive exits, whether that's transition players, or whether that's um, on, on, on attack. But the guy is really, really, he's not going to offer you that much anywhere else. In. He's not a great carrier. His body height is too high when he goes into the breakdown. But you are going to have an outstanding lineup. You've got a decision to make. You and your assistant coach has got that decision to make, which is the area of the game that's going to give us the best return. Am I prepared to go with the next best five lock? Who may, but, but our lineup might then go down to, to uh, 40 or 50% and it might be a flick of a coin. But really, he hits rucks like there's no tomorrow. His work rate is much better. Those are the decisions you make. That's the reason why I, I, I had to put in there, it's not an exact science. You still have the ability, you still have the ability to, uh, um, to be able to make those decisions. And I'll just finish with one final thing is, the, the, often there's a lot of players that we come across who've got serious X factor. And they don't do it a lot of the time in the game. But when they do do it in the game, it can literally open up the game for you. And again, I don't know how many times that is. You don't know. It could be five times in the game. It could be twice. But he has got such a good X factor that you really want him in the team. But he doesn't tick the box from a work rate point of view. He's not unbelie unbelievably effective in other things that you ask him to do. It, it's still your decision. It's still your gut feel to be able to say, I think that this guy can create magic. And so much of that gut feel is also going to go towards Christian. The confidence that he gives the other players in the field. You know, again, a good relationship with your leadership group. They might be unanimous and we want this guy in the field. He gives us confidence. We know when he carries the defensive team shit themselves. And they don't want him carrying the ball. So therefore, he might only do it a hell of a lot less than we want him to. But he's so effective with it, it opens up other opportunities. And that's where it's... it's Coaching is, is an art. It's, it's a, you know, you've got to make those decisions. It's just try and get as much data and, and information at your fingertips when you make those decisions because ultimately you want to make the correct decision. That's awesome, Gary. Just one, one other one that uh, sort of came to mind. Uh, when Mick Byrne was uh, out here, I think in 2018, he was saying that the Wallabies were, were working on becoming world-class in dominant tackles. And I think when I started to watch the following games, you could notice that it was actually to the detriment of sticking effective tackles. They, you, a number of them were rushing up and actually missing the tackle to try and make a positive tackle. Um, do you see that um, sometimes players are pushed towards getting better numbers um, to the detriment of sticking to a game plan? I'm afraid the answer is yes. And again, that comes a little bit back to us as coaches. And again, in that piece that I mentioned earlier, uh, whilst I didn't enjoy the piece, I reflected on it. And, and I think the message that was coming through on that is that you don't want to use these stats as a stick to beat the players with. And, and, and you don't, and, and what, what the players that were spoken to in the, in the piece were saying is that um, it was just all about the facts. And the, the, the stats, I beg your pardon. And on a Monday morning, they'd come back in, win, lose, or draw, and they'd literally get beaten with a stick or handed the carrot to say, yes, you achieved what the, these stats, and, and that's all the players went out to do. That's a debate on its own. That's an hour and a half webinar just on its own debating about the merits of that because you could, on one hand, argue, well, if he is achieving that, then he's doing what you ask him to do. But but it's not that simple. It, 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 it isn't that simple, and that's what, where... Um, I, I hope I've made the, got the message across loud and clear. The ability to sit and have the one-on-ones with individual players is the most paramount importance. Because once you as the coach, whether that's you the unit coach or you the head coach, and you've sat down with a player and you've had this one-on-one -on -one with him, then there can be no doubt in the clarity as to why we're using that information. It can't just be about you didn't hit your numbers, therefore you didn't play well. It can't be about that. It could have been so many other things. Again, I, I keep going back to the leadership thing, but it could have been him rallying the troops. It could have been how well he spoke under the poles when our back was against the wall. When momentum was swinging against us, he made that call for the next play, which was a smart play because it was conservative and got us back onto the sheet and, 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 and he made the, the correct call and he deserves credit for that as well. So again, 
Um, unfortunately, the answer is yes to your question, but I think it's a big red flag that we need to have as coaches. And that's why when, when, when Ando and, and, and Dylan and them asked me to do this, this is a topic I love talking about, but I'm also wary about talking about it as well, because I'm not saying use the data to beat the player with. Just use it as a guideline going forward and use common sense. Awesome. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. Do you want to go on to the, the next part of the presentation? Yeah, sure. So uh, what I need to do, I need to share with you guys again. You don't have my screen, eh? Not now, no. Okay. So let me turn that mic off. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. So let's continue. So let's have a look at the effectiveness of team plays now. We've, we've spoken about individuals. Obviously, the team play is the sum of the parts. It's all of the individual stuff, which, quite frankly, is, is probably the most important. But you're hoping that the sum of the parts brings you the outcome of what you're looking for. So, again, uh, just putting it up as a screenshot, scrums and lineouts, pretty straightforward, effective plays from, from lineouts, effective plays from scrums. Again, if you're going to be spending hours and hours of developing plays from scrums and developing strategy and the chess of it and how to outsmart the opposition, well, if you're putting the time into putting a plan that you think is going to work really well, you should measure it. You should see if it is working. The effective phases per, um, and the average um, of those phases and the effectiveness of it, the effectiveness of fa phases in creating space and creating mismatches or creating numbers in the opposition. Ultimately, guys, that's what this game is about. We're there to create um, space, mismatches, or numbers on the opposition. So we are the hoping that if we get lightning quick ball, we get numbers into a position where they don't have, we've got space. If it's mismatches, we're wanting to get our bigger, faster, stronger guys against their, their fatties, or numbers is quite, quite obviously, we've got more numbers than them, and therefore we can execute it properly. Again, always going back to how you're training, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Your decision-making in general play. Interesting thing about decision-making. There's this perception, incorrectly in my opinion, you can't measure decision-making. I think you can. Now, you may not necessarily want to spend your time and energy on, on measuring decision-making for every single position in the field, but certainly the people who make more decisions, your nines, your tens, twelves, and fifteens, um, possibly some of your loose forwards, it's, it's well worth an exercise. Again, all you really have to do is... When you're doing some form of an analysis, if they put in a situation where there's a couple of options, did they opt for the right decision in that situation? And just give them a simple score out of that. Again, only for the purpose of developing them as individuals. Decision-making options from turnovers, decision-making options from general play that you're also doing. Effective kicks. Did, did we have a kicking game that worked well for us? Did we kick the ball where we got a net gain out of it? And, and the kick was the correct decision because they had very few numbers in the backfield. We hit grass. We had the right people on our feet to chase. It was a great decision. It was a great execution. They were under pressure. They kicked the ball out and we got a line out 37 meters further down the field. All in all, it was a very good decision. And decision-making of the execution of nine and tens, as I, as I mentioned. Those are just some of the examples. You, you can go into a lot more detail or you can keep it a lot more as a headline. Okay, so let's have a look at what that looks like. So this is the one, again, I'm, 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 I've mentioned it before and I'm going to mention it again. I really try and keep the pieces of information to one page. One page, headline, big sucker punch. Even though in saying that, I'm contradicting myself a little bit because this is quite a lot of information. But if you have a look at it, this is the information around our attack and we've got big aspirations to want to attack well. So there were quite a few more key performance indicators in attack. Very simple headline pieces of information around our set piece. It either functions or it doesn't function. It's as simple as that. Three headline pieces of information around our kicking game, two pieces of information around our defense, and a, two, a couple of pieces of information around our discipline. The one other area that we do spend time with, and I appreciate that a lot of um, coaches at club level or at school level will not have the ability to do this, but also measuring momentum within the game is a big thing, but that again also is a webinar on its own because I think that's something where we can really affect the, the ebb and flow of the game. So in this situation, let me tell you how the targets came about. What happens every year is 
I will, um, myself and, 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 and the coaches, what we'll do is we'll have a look at the last 12 months. We'll have a look at the trends in the game. And fundamentally, we'll probably take four or five of the best teams in world rugby. And, and it won't necessarily be international. It'll be at a club game or a club level, or it'll be at a regional level. So it'll be, if it's the year the Waratahs are doing outstandingly well, the Crusaders are doing outstandingly well, Leinster are doing brilliantly, and Wasps are doing brilliantly, and uh, Claremont are doing brilliantly. We'll take those five teams, for example. And over an extended period of time, because their seasons are so long, so Super Rugby is 18 games, Obviously, the premiership and top 14 is 28 games. So we know we're going to get decent enough data. And we know, ultimately, they've all been successful because they're all the championship teams or they've all, all, they've all um, been a very successful team. And we may even look at a team who's been very successful and also plays the type of game that we want to play. And then we'll go and have a look at what did they do that stood out as a point of difference that made them be successful. It's as simple as that. And then what did they achieve? And that's where you get those target numbers from. We just went out. So, gold zone. Gold zone is the opposition 22. And some people call it red. We all got our different things. That's the gold zone. Ideally, we want, when we're in that area, we want to execute at 60%. So, any entry we have there, and the next one goes to it, we ideally want 10 entries. We think if we get 10 entries and we had 60% success, we'll, we will win more games than we lose. And that is based on the data that we've got from those high-performing teams, wherever they are. And the same thing goes with dominant carries, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the interesting thing, guys and girls. Here's the really interesting thing for this. Why I really like the KPI score indicator is because not only does it, does it relate in terms of whether it's successful or not, that's almost past the time. The thing that's very, very important for me and very powerful for me is over a period of time, if this turnover attack execution, or where's a really poor one, counterattack, Counterattack at 18%, where our goal is 60% effectiveness from counterattacks. And we do want to counterattack because we understand that it is a, it's an element of the game we want. It's a piece of our DNA that we really want to be good at. And also because we believe that it's an area where we can hurt people. And we function at 18%. And the week before, we were at 23%. The week before, we were at maybe only 41%. That is obviously an area for us, as you'll see from this, that we're then going to sp spend a lot of time. So this is just one day in a team session. We all have it. But then I know when we're doing our planning, I'm going to take that information and I'm going to put my time and energy into it. Assuming it's a headline stat on your KPI indicators, that's so important that you think it can have a difference in the game, uh, then it's important enough for you, to, for you to put your time and energy into it. And again, this may look like a lot, but it actually isn't really a lot of, of, of work if you think about it. It's just... You are going to have turnover, turnovers and you want to attack effectively. You are going to have lineouts and scrums and counterattack. Those are fundamentally the four most important ways you can gain, obviously from a restart as well, but you can gain possession. Well, let's do something with it. That's, that's what the attack coach wants to do. Whoever's running the breakdown, we know that ultimately if we lose our way, we lose our shape, or we go out of our attacking pattern, we still want to have effective ball. We want to have ball that's, that's onto or over the gain line and we want a reasonably quick ball. And that's what we put a lot of time and energy into. So we're not measuring anything here that we're not coaching. And if we're not successful from a consistent period of time, I'm not talking about a one-off blip where we lose a couple of lineouts and that obviously affects all our, our plays from lineouts. If it's a blip, it's fine. But if it's a pattern that's starting to creep in and it's important enough for us to put it on a KPI scorecard, it's important enough for us to be able to affect it from a training point of view. So again, I warn against cutting and pasting training sessions and just align them to be the same week in and week out. I'm saying to you, taking that piece of information that you've got from the indicators that you've got, making sure that you're referring to that and you're putting your time and energy into it. And I'm sure every single one of us on the call, every single one of us on the call have had a situation where if you've had a bad day at the breakdown and you put a little bit of emphasis if it's a fast day on the Monday and you're only doing recovery and you do some passive breakdown stuff and then on Tuesday when it's your heavy day, you do a little bit more live and you go into and you, you, you give the guys 15 minutes of the breakdown instead of the usual two or three minutes. And then on Thursday during the warm-up, you do a top-up. Inevitably, that weekend, it, it goes very well. And then again here, so this is a line-out play. If we have seen that we've got a particular plan, this is a change of direction play, and we're not happy with it in the piece of information, let's have a look at it on the training field. Let's fix it before we get to a game. So here's just an example of how we've done it. 
Very, very simple. You can do this in Keynote or in Numbers or in, in it's just a visual aid. So that's the alt, the um, objective of this um, play was that was the area we wanted to strike within the vacuum, the disconnect at the back of the liner. It was really important that we hit that area first. That was where we wanted the second guy to go and we weren't happy with the people's positioning. So we just helped them along. The software is available, it's online, it's free. You move the individuals, visually, they're getting to see what you're not happy with. And before you've even shown any footage, I'm not even gonna show footage here. Then we want the 13 to be in that position. That's what the first breakdown is gonna look like. If you remember where we showed it's gonna be. There you can see um, the ball carriers coming around the corner. That's where we want to be able to strike. So we open up enough of a blind for us to be able to go back to eventually. We think he's too wide. We ideally want him a little bit tighter. We really want him hurting their pillow or their guard right next to that rock. That's where we want him to strike so that they overfold. And then again, what's happening off the ball, we want to rearrange that. And we want him to stay on the open side. Those are the options that we want. The two centers, we want to split them. And then the guys that are not involved, we want them a little, oh, sorry, that jumped too, too early. We want them a little bit further out. And then you want to be able to see that that's what the picture is that you're trying to paint. And again, if you have the ability and it's on the iPad, you can do it at the training view. Okay. The last thing I'm going to show you quickly now, I'm going to break away from this for a second. The last piece of information I want to show you is, is, is a bit of fun, um, actually. Uh, just it's some piece of information that we've played around with the GPS. And, and, and again, I absolutely appreciate, you know, a lot of the guys on the call won't have the ability to have GPS, but I'm, I'm talking again to the point of player accountability and using the information to develop the player and give accurate information to the player so that the individual can be the best player that he, that, that he, that he can be. And this is just something that we played around with. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a gremlin. So this was a piece of information. Um, this was footage. This was um, exits. And we said that we want to use exit situations as an opportunity. So we want to turn it into an opportunity where we, from an exit, when we're under pressure, midfield scrum, in our own 22, in our own uh, 25, we want to make sure that we turn this into an opportunity. So what are the key fundamentals we're going to have to do? We're going to have to make sure that our scrum is sturdy. We have to make sure that the delivery to the 10 is very good. And ultimately, we, get, we have set targets for the individuals in terms of what a kick chase looks like because we want to exert absolute maximum pressure on the opposition. So I'll show you what the play looks like. Very simple. 9 to 10. 10 kicks it. We want him to kick. as We don't want the, the ball out in this particular situation unless he can get it other side of the halfway line. And we want the two guys outside him to put extreme pressure and to chase. And our fundamentals that we said, and then try and put them under huge pressure so that they kick the ball out. Okay. And uh, we want the net gain. Ironically enough, the play works. So you think the play works. And we get a line out. You can see where the linesman is just the other side of the halfway line. Would you take that? Yes, I take that nine out of 10 times. Is it what we said we wanted to do? No. And I'll show you why. So what we did is we put the GPS onto the players. And with the GPS and how we were able to um, formulate the GPS is we, um, every single player had a bespoke skill, uh, a speed test. And we knew exactly the speed that every single one of these players were able to, to have. So there's your footage over there. And these are their monitors on them. So that's the fly off over there. That's the scrum. That's the first outside back. That's, he's a fullback and that's the wing. And interestingly enough, that, that's who they are. That's their names, their initials. And every time this ring turns a different color, we know he's in a different zone of his speed. Interestingly enough, high speed running, which he can do, and he can do, um, we know because of his high speed data that we have, um, in our database, he is set that in excess of uh, in excess of seventy five percent of his high speed max, that circle around him will turn red. Okay, and we have said we've made a deal with the players that from a performance point of view, this is hair on fire. If we're going to not kick the ball out, we're going to kick it downfield. We have to make sure that the plan that we've got 
is going to execute the very best skill, put them under extreme pressure. So in fact, what we got was a net gain that worked. At this moment in time, there's the kick that's gone. You can't see it because obviously the ball doesn't have a GPS. There, the wing is red. The fullback has never even got to red. He's got to orange. So that is between 65 and 75% of his high speed max. And then interestingly enough, from the halfway line, he never hits red again. So whilst we still got a good net gain, if I go back to the footage, if I go back to the footage, and this is a different angle, there's the fullback over there. There's the wing out of shot. He'll come in in a second. We know that at this particular moment in time, he might have hit a few high-speed meters. But while these guys were messing about with the ball, and it did go out, he's slowing down. So while the ball is in air over here, because of the fundamentals we spoke about, we actually had the opportunity to possibly have put so much pressure onto them that either we, we would have been defending a line out over there or if he had taken the quick throw, which he did do, we could have put them under huge pressure and maybe even forced them to kick the ball worse than they actually did. Again, the point being, really, all I'm really trying to say is when I go back to the point, is that fundamentally, what we're looking to do is we're looking to um, ensure that we've got a measurement, we've put it in place for a specific reason, and we're revisiting that from a statistical point of view to improve the player. So whilst we've got a net gain, and this happens very positively, and maybe can even go back to DJ's question a little bit earlier, sometimes you don't get the results you want, but the process is a good process, and we're happy with the process and we feel we're on the right track. And maybe just the opposition have done it better than you. In this case, we actually got the outcome we wanted. We got a good outcome. We would have taken it, but it could have been better. And again, that just speaks to using um, data, an analysis, and pieces of information we have to the best of our ability to ensure that we're constantly pushing the boundaries to be able to get better and better. So if I relate it back, and I'm pretty much going to finish on this, and I'm going to leave it up to questions. If we take it back to a team like the USA, where we're trying to understand what is it going to take to become a tier one team, and we're way off it at the moment. A little bit before we even get to tier one, what are we ever going to have to be to become a top 10 team in the world? That chase is going to have to be at 100%, or in excess of 75% of his high speed skills. That's the deal we've made. If he's not going to do that, and that's not against his teammates, that's against Johnny Sexton, Johnny Sexton will catch that ball and he will stick it all the way back downtown, and you'll be having your own line out just outside your own 22. And so actually the whole purpose of the exercise is to ensure that these guys understand that there's a direct correlation between the analysis that we're using to the very best of the ability for us to be the best team we can. This is what you've got to do. Don't worry about the outcome in the situation that happened to work in your favor. When you're playing against the best teams in the world, they will punish you if you don't do that. And hence the reason why we always want this correlation between what is your objective, how do we plan it, and how do you review it to ensure that we're getting back to be able to go back so that the process has a full circle that closes the whole time and that we're going back to understanding, guys, there's a reason why we want to do this. Get a buy-in from the team. and goes back to my initial point earlier about where the visualization and giving them feedback comes into it. That guy could say to me, but hang on, we ended up getting a line out in their half. And I'll go, yeah, but we could have had a line out on the 22, which means the entire, or you could have charged them down Tackle, steal, our penalty, we kick the corner, now we're going to line on a five-year line. Emanating from a midfield scrum in your own 22, which is the two best scenarios. The one is an out-and-out -out attack platform. The other one is a, well, you know, we're going to play a line out outside the 22. You know, it's against better teams in the world, you, it's highly unlikely you're going to score against an island or an England from, you know, 45 meters out. You've got a much better chance when you're five or 10 meters out. And those are the, those are the margins. Those are the margins in terms of being able to give feedback back to a team to become better and better than they actually are, or it's just an acceptable norm. So I hope that that's just drawn a line in, in, um, under my presentation, but also just to say to you that the circle has got to close the whole time. It's about having a process. It's about being able to analyze and execute the process. And then fundamentally, it's about closing it by reviewing it. And so often we don't review that. And, and review that in terms of going back to a guy like Gannon and, 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 Moss, and um, Madison, who were the two guys on the outside, and say to them, guys, that's not, that's not what the deal was. That's not what we said. That's not what world class looks like. And, and in our case, you know, un until we get to understand that, we probably, you know, we're, we're going to be treading water in terms of where we are at the moment. 
So again, that's just in terms of high performance process and understanding the difference between don't always be um, don't always be uh, succumb by the by the outcome because sometimes it works in your favor and sometimes it doesn't. Gary, anyhow, just what, guys, just that, while that's there, basically. Just, Gary, just while you're on that particular area around, you mentioned correlation. So training analysis, um, buy-in, you mentioned buy-in, and also the conversion then to performance. How hard is it for the player, you know, with that amount of information, um, you know, is it, get, is it to get conversion? So you talk so, from training, the buy-in, performance, you know, the whole area of buy-in is a critical one. Yeah. So again, and uh, if, if I can go back to when I showed that um, the individual players feedback form, again, there were four headline pieces of information that was a loose forward. A 10 might have had three other pieces of headline information that were his ball, uh, uh, um, his jackals wouldn't have been a, a fundamental for us. So again, I think initially within the plan is to keep it as simple and as, and, and as um, relevant to that p p particular individual in the particular position he plays so that that's going to have the biggest return. And then, and then the, the, the transfer of that information. So let's say, let's say for, for, for use of an example, and let's just take a rule of thumb and say three aspects of his game, just three aspects of his game. What is going to make, um, what, is gonna, what are those three aspects that he can turn into a super strength? And if those are the only three aspects that you have a look at and look to develop within them, you know, nine out of 10 times, you're going to be able to get a better player. So I think, again, hence my point in the beginning of the conversation about worrying about analysis paralysis, be careful not to, to worry about that too much and that you're giving too much information over. Um, and then conversely, when you are giving the information, make sure it's the three headline piece of information. That's why I don't like that RDP form to be too clustered with information give him the headline fact and then just review that and deep dive into that rather so that he gets a real feel of, of what he can do. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's probably trying to get to, is it, do you find, you know, the buy-in or the sell uh, to the individual? Do you, do you find it more, um, a, I suppose, do you have to change the way you speak to individuals with, with this particular area like analysis? like? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we, we joked on, on the phone the other day, uh, and I won't mention his name on the call because he'll have a lot of mates on the call, but, you know, we did uh, in 2008 uh, when we were the Stormers, we did brain profiling for the players because we were really interested to understand how players think, you know, and, and we should. I mean, again, a luxury not all of us can afford. I certainly can't afford it in the States now. But it was really interesting to understand that, you know, in the brain profiling of the players, uh, we had a 10 who it would be like putting needles in his eyes if you started throwing too much data and, and facts at him. It was interesting for us to know that because while we wanted the guy to still run the, the, the show properly as a 10, we had to understand that our language we used with him was very much more creative as opposed to throwing numbers at him. So we could still achieve the same outcome, and that is that he made good decisions, he understood what to do in the field, people around him knew what he was going to do, and he still had the freedom to make those decisions on the fly and, 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 and um, see the space that's in front of him. But you do that maybe more in a visual way and you take the numbers away from him. So it's really just about understanding what appeals to, to, to the various different players. Some players absolutely really want to hang on the numbers, and, and again, that, that goes a little bit to Christian's point earlier is, is sometimes I'm actually almost pushing the guys away from going onto the numbers because, because they'll want to use that as a stick to hit us with as coaches. They'll say, well, I hit my numbers, so therefore why are you not picking me? And, and again, that's the reason why I can't stress enough. It's a tool. It's a device. Yeah. But if you're not going to do it, and uh, this is the thing that, I, that perplexes me against the real cynics about doing analysis or having these facts at your fingertips. If you're not going to do it, and that's fine. If you're absolutely adamant that you don't want to do stats and you don't want to devise analytics or you don't want to go down the street, or you don't want to go to this depth, that's not a problem at all. I'm just going to say to you, ultimately at the end of the day, you have a responsibility to develop the players and become better players. If you don't know what they're doing, how are you giving that information to them? 
Yeah. How are you teaching them if you don't know that? How is a school teacher supposed to teach the curriculum to the, pe to the students if he, if, if he or she doesn't understand what that curriculum is about? If I don't have the knowledge myself as a teacher, how am I going to teach it to somebody else? And, and, and that's fundamentally where I'm coming from. The teacher can't go to class the first day and open the first day, page of the textbook and be on, uh, and, excuse the pun, be on the same page as the students where he knows as little or she knows as little as what the students do has to have a fundamental understanding, hence the reason why it's gone to university to study. And that's the same thing from our point of view. At the end of the day, we're educators. We have to be teachers as coaches. We have to be teachers. And, 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 and actually, that's the thing. And so with a lot of respect, I think a lot of the things where I see people get it wrong is we're not instructors. We're coaches. We're teachers. So we have the ability to learn. That could be, and I think it should be, but that's just my opinion, it should be very much player driven. <clears throat> what do you think you need to do to become the best fly off in world rugby? In our team, in our team, not world rugby. What do you think, if, if you want to play fly off in our team, and it's a club in Western Australia, what do you have to be to be the best player? And let the player understand it, and you'll get a good understanding in terms of the player understands his role. And then together you, 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 you formulate it. So a lot of this stuff will be, why do you think I want to pick you as a blind side flanker? Or why do you think I want to pick you as a tight head prop? Well, I think you, you want me to scrum fundamentally, first and foremost. Correct. You're correct in that. Right. How are we going to measure that you've been effective? That's all it is. Yeah. It's not overly complicated. And I'm not trying to make it, you know, bullshit them with, with data and that kind of stuff. It's not at all what the objective is. It's, it's just a tool to be able to use to improve the player and ultimately the sum of the parts to prove the team. Jill, did you want to open that chat line up, mate? Yeah, yeah. So I've got Colin. Um, Colin, I'll just bring you in now, mate. I've got two done. Um, guys, I've got some great detail. Um, I've kind of looked at it from a slightly different angle, kind of looking at the coach. Um, we're talking about using the analysis to make the players better. Um, have you used it to, to make yourself better as a coach, um, kind of analysing what you do as a coach in terms of the percentage of structured, the unstructured on the pitch? which is something we've talked a lot about here in Western Australia, uh, and looking at your coaching delivery, kind of the open, closed questions and, and kind of coding the responses and reactions from the players. Hang on a sec. I think we might have lost him. I can hear something in the back. Hang on. He's on. Yeah, I can hear him. Hang on a sec, Gary. I'm just going to mute you and then bring you back on because I think there might be something going on your computer. I think we might have lost him, mate. Yeah, you just want to go on that point, um, Ando, and then I'll try bring him back in. Just mention that again, Cole. Um, yeah, I was just looking at the, I suppose, instead of analysing and coding the the players and the, the rugby that's going on just yep. as, a, as a reflection tool for a coach, uh, you want to make yourself better, um, kind of how, how basically filming yourself, coaching, how you code that and break that down. Is that something that is done, used and uh, different I think things to another, look at? That's a fantastic um, approach to you know, coach development. Um, I mean, obviously visual, as, as we've spoken about before in our pathway. Oh, there he is, he's back. You there, Gary? He's on mute again, mate. Yeah, a sec. Sorry, guys. So, Cole, third time lucky. Here we go. Here we go. I'm just going to change the question now. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, guys. <laughs> so, tell us some stories about Ando. No, I don't. No, don't. No, don't. <laughs> yeah, no, so, guys, I was kind of looking at it from the perspective of making yourself better as a coach um, in terms of the, the footage you've got access to, uh, getting yourself mic'd up, 
Um, how have you have you done, and, and kind of what, how have you analysed the, the session that's gone on? Uh, we talk a lot about unstructured versus structured here, and and kind of looking at some of the que like questioning, open closed question, and percentage, and and even reactions from the players um, in your in your sessions. Sorry, Cole. So, what's the question? Sorry, I'm I'm not hearing what the question is. Um, it's just, just how, do you, basically, do you analyse your coaching in a similar way? Uh, not enough, um, but yes. Um, um, honestly, not enough. But I, but I, I think it's a it's a it's a very good um, it's a very good question. Um, I have been um, in in organisations before where we've had um, outside guys within within the team environment, but possibly still associated with the club or the organisation, to do an analysis on the messaging. Um, that we've given in team meetings, that we've given in pre and post game uh, reviews, and um, that we've given live in the game as well. Um, and some of it at the time was it was not pretty to have a look at the information. Again, um, heavily criticised for repeating myself and repeating the same messages. Um, again, on game day, uh, allowing the emotions to get. Um, you know, I'm just thinking of the criticisms towards me. Allowing the emotions to, to dictate too much about your decision making when really, and, and became it became a uh, it became a real work on for me. You know, to ensure that um, I was staying calm and giving that picture to the players that the information I was giving was based on the same on the same data and the same facts that I wanted to work with. Um, and it, it was a big learning curve. You know, again, I, I was never. No, none of us are perfect. I'm certainly was never going to be, but when we actually did that feedback, the, the it, it was scary. It was scary about you know how much information we're given, how much white noise we talk. You know, there's um, so many times during a, a coaching session you'll stop to say something, and you know your S and C coach is rolling his eyes at you because you're just losing the intensity. And the bottom line is, you go back and have a look at it, and players aren't even listening to you. You just you're, you're talking crap. It's white noise. You're not getting a clear, succinct message across. So, um, again, I, I would say to you, Cole, a, a lot of it should be player-driven. Let the players get the messages out. Do your talking in the team meetings and get your messages clear. But I'll tell you what was very interesting for me, and, and, and um, Rob might, might um, pop in and give his five cents. Of, go, going to coach in Japan was, was an absolute, was a game-changer for me because you're coaching with an interpreter. And your team meetings are still only 40 minutes, if that's what you want to keep them at, 45 minutes, because the players don't concentrate for very much longer. So now everything you've got to say to the team, you've still got your 45 minutes, but you, everything that's got to be said has got to be interpreted. So for me, it was a huge learning curve in terms of saying the most important things I needed to say and get the message across as quickly as possible because it had to be interpreted. Obviously, they couldn't go on my emotions. If I started swearing, and look, they looked at me as if I was crazy because they didn't know what I was talking about half the time. So it was a huge learning curve for me to coach in Japan because it really put me under huge pressure to get the messages that I needed to get across, the facts, details, the information the players want to hear to get better and improve, get that message across. Otherwise, you know, don't get the message across. So yes, it's been an exercise I've done a couple of times and um, yeah, hopefully the older we get, the better we become at it. And the, certainly, certainly it, it draws a lot, a lot of awareness to to areas that, that can ordinarily be, you know, areas of weakness as, as coaches. Perfect. No, cheers, thanks. Uh, Dan Wiston, bring you in mind. You're, you're off mute now. Thanks very much. And how's it, Gary? Uh, been a while Danny. since we shared a, a lemonade at Villages in Cape Town. How are you? But very well in you, Danny. Good to see good, you. Good, mate. Good. Thanks. And you. Uh, thanks very much for the insights. It's been wonderful to see uh, the success of your career um, over the last 25 years. So well done, mate. Uh, awesome. Um, nice, I've, I've got two questions, if I may. One is probably a little bit of detail, and then the other one's um, tied to the NFL um, in terms of analysis. Um, but I'll save that for later. Uh, just in terms of that kicking example you showed, Gary, um, do you have to be careful with regards to the analysis of, of perhaps setting individual standards to drive their performance and keeping a balance with the overall quality of the team performance? And, and specifically on that one that I noticed, it, it was more about 
if you've got a winger who runs the 111 seconds and maybe a, a 15 or a 12 or 13 that does it in, say, 12, um, you know, a 50, 60 yard kick is, you, you're going to have about a five or 10 meter gap. Um, and I would argue or assert that you're probably better off having a defensive line with two people, obviously, defend, depending on the attacking um, counterattack. Um, but you'd think that they'd have two or three coming back. How, how, how much does that influence your decision uh, making for the individual to drive a standard? You, you were talking about the 75% in hair on fire type stuff, whereas I'd probably look at it the other way and go, if your winger's going to sprint up, you're going to leave gaps in your defensive line. Yeah, uh, again, you know, the decision making comes, uh, you can go into quite a lot of depth with this. The decision making comes with, firstly, how good was the kick initially? You know, did the kick uh, do what it needed to do, which was hit grass? Um, again, you know, that play would have been planned because we were hoping the fullback was very heavily right footed. And so him going to his left was going to be something that wasn't going to be uncomfortable for him. So we wanted to put him under pressure from that point of view. Um, but by the very same token, um, if we understand what the objective is, and if you remember at the beginning of the clip, I said what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at a defensive opportunity, a defensive situation, and turn it into an opportunity. And, an op and then we, we listed what that opportunity could be. So one of the things that they said is, well, can I run? I said, yeah, you can run. You can run, but what are the, what are the metrics going to be in terms of what you're going to run? I'm not saying to you, you have to kick the ball. I'm saying to you, how are we going to turn this into an opportunity? Are we just going to kick the ball? like 80% of the teams do and you kick it out because you're in your 22 and then, you know, nobody thinks twice about it or can we turn it into an opportunity where fundamentally we want to get the possession back? So that's why I say they achieved that. So yes, again, if there was a perfect way to have an attack system or there was a perfect defensive system that worked or the kicking game, if this, wor this works every single time, everybody would be doing it. For everything in rugby that you do, there's going to be an area that you, you have a weakness. How do you use your nine in defense? Do you use him to close the short side because you don't want your nine making tackles because the smallest guy on the field? Or do you want to sweep him as a sweeper to, to worry about the chips? In the, wherever you have him, there's going to be a weakness somewhere else. Or you're going to be down a number in the defensive line. So, again, as long as you've taken into – exactly the same as I, would, or I really like to use is like a contesting policy. So often when – we're planning with coaches a defensive, a defensive contesting policy, which does my head in when you're spending hours and hours and hours and hours on a defensive policy at lineouts. I'm talking about contesting, but your own lineout is only functioning at 65%. For five, six, you know, why don't you spend the time in your own lineout working and not so much time on the contesting and actually in the contesting say, hey, you know what? This is the area of the lineout we don't want them winning the ball. So we're going to take that away, and that's a given. So if they take it at the front of the line, we're going to take away the back. I know what my role is. I know where I'm going to go. I know I'm going to, how I'm going to close the vacuum. So you're not going to cover everything all of the time. And so the same example, going back to your point, Danny, is with a kick chase. If I'm saying to him, you've got license to go at in excess of 75% of your high speed, we know that there's going to be gaps in behind. We're just hoping that the balance between the return on our investment is going to be more often than not, is going to be the fact that they are going to make the mistake because they're now under pressure because we've taken a right, heavily right footed fullback, stuck him on the left hand side. He's not comfortable making that kick, especially with two people who he didn't really expect to be coming at him from that distance and that we think that we're going to get a good return on our investment. And you will have a plan B and a plan C behind that. You will. You will have your, you'll have your chase line and then you'll have what we call a net line. And the net line will be in there in case you don't get there or the kick goes too far. That clip happened to be at altitude, high, high altitude in Colorado. So that's why the ball went as far as it did. That can hurt you. As you say, that could hurt you. But do you have a plan B? Because if you're going to go with that, then have a look at all the scenarios that go along with that and ensure that you've really just stacked the chips in the very best favor that you're going to get a return on that. Same with the run. He, I don't mind if they wanted to run in that situation. I'll leave the players to make that decision. But then what does that game look like? He should, in that running situation, if it's on because they've left numbers, he should at least get to, because um, he was on the 22, he should at least get well past the 10-yard line, hopefully onto the halfway line. And then we should be able, because they're retreating, we should be on the front foot. We should be able to play with width, hurt them in the midfield, or even play behind them and hurt them on the, on the edge, on the far edge where they're scrambling to get to. And if we do that, and we've ticked all those boxes or those are the scenarios, then at least we're putting the odds in our favor to be able to be as successful as we can be. 
But but you know, we do have a look at the scenario and we have a look at you know what could go wrong with this. And and that is why less is more for me, Danny, because mm. if you've got less things that you're doing and you're having a look at the scenarios, then you can put all your time and energy into getting that done and feeling comfortable with the fact that you're going to get a return on that. But you are right. I mean, there there isn't a there isn't a perfect you know, a uh, template that I can give you and say, yes, that works every time. I think it comes back to Ando's point as well, which is about the communication. So as long as the individual player knows what's expected of them from that particular situation or circumstance, then, then you're going to give them the pass mark for it. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. You know, and I'm very happy if the player comes to me and says, well, I, I don't want to go full out there. You know, I, I feel more comfortable. I feel very, very vulnerable. If you tell me to go at that speed, I feel very vulnerable that this guy could step me and then, you know, we could, we could have a counter attack on it. And then we'll discuss that. You know, we'll discuss that. And, and I'm very, very happy that if they say that outcome is good enough for us, then that's fine. That's fine as a good enough outcome. We're happy that we can decide on that as a group. You know, it's not a, it's, 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 it's not a dictatorial scenario where we're saying that's the way you've got to do it. And that's non-negotiable. I'm just saying to you, that particular wing, for example, that guy, Gannon Moore, is really quick. I mean, he's extraordinarily quick. I mean, he's, he's top five quick. In, he, he, he was a, a, a track athlete. So, I mean, he, he, he does run the 100 in 10 and a half seconds. So, all I'm talking about is using the guy's strength to our ability. When you kick him, we were playing Canada on that field a week later. And so we knew that the altitude was going to work in our favor. And so that's why we ideally didn't want to kick the ball out. It did end up going out in that particular clip. But we thought, well, rather let's just put the, the Canadian fullback, who's heavily right-footed, onto his left foot and put him under pressure. And with that kind of speed, put him under pressure and, and, and you know, hopefully he'll make a mistake. So the, it, was, it was all about, I used it on a webinar the other day. It, it's no different when you go into the roulette table. Uh, Danny, you know, you can put all your chips on, on 32 and then you've got a 1 in 36 or 1 in 39 chance or you can uh, hedge your bets and you can go black or red, you know. All that's going to happen is the odds are just going to go more in your favour. And, and I think fundamentally, um, again, particularly if you're left brain and we're talking about data and, and analysis at the moment, all you're really trying to do is just get the odds in your favour more often than they're not to give yourself the best chance. And then going back to the earlier, the, the, sorry, the last thing I want to say on this is, Going back to the point of the whole reason behind it, when I asked the why, it's just to give clarity, which lends to confidence. That's all you're trying to do. Just give clarity. And once you've exhausted all those questions with the players and you say, right, guys, we all agreed that this is the way it's going to go. Well, the players have agreed. Then they've got clarity to go out and do it. Hopefully that gives them confidence. That's all it really is. It's just about to give them clarity and certainty. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Dan. I'm really conscious of your time, Gary. We just have one more question. It'll be the last one from Callum, and then we'll be able to wrap it up. So, Callum, you're off me now. Hi, right, cool. Uh, hey, mate. Um, thanks for tonight so far. I've just got a question about sort of the, the big picture around your analysis. Um, you spoke earlier sort of focusing 80% on us and 20% on the opposition. Uh, but how do you sort of decide how much time or resources within your program you dedicate to statistical analysis? versus things like team building, culture, um, session planning. I don't have that as a number, raw number that I could bullshit you and just tell you off the top of my head. Um, again, a lot of, is a real interesting thing. This is, you know, analysis is very much like that, that cliched picture of an iceberg, where you literally see the top of it in terms of what you deliver to the players but there's so much more underlying information beforehand. So often on opposition analysis, for example, um, on opposition analysis, on the, uh, if we're playing, we're, we're playing the Waratahs on the Saturday and the following weekend we're playing the Highlanders. On the Friday before we play the Waratahs, I'll do all the opposition analysis on the Highlanders. And on the Sunday, I'll just top and tail it for the game that they played on the weekend. But I would have a look at the Highlanders eight, nine days in advance I'd have a look at everything and build a profile of, uh, around them in terms of what their DNA is and, and what their headline pieces of information are. The players will never know to the detail that I've gone to. I, I will just come out and give them the headline pieces of information on the day that it's, it's the relevant day to speak about the Highlanders. But, I mean, again, the time you spend with a team is very different with the time that you spend alone in the, as a coaching group doing the analysis. So, 
um, spend a lot more time doing opposition analysis as a coaching group and a lot more time doing our own analysis as a coaching group. Um, but we're very mindful on the time that you'll spend in delivering it to the players. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. So again, it's also determined, and I said it in the beginning, is determined by the amount of time you have as well, it is, is, which is predominantly what does happen at club game is if it's week in and week out, then that's why it's important to take three games of an opposition as a rule of thumb, have a look at the fundamental piece of information of the opposition, fill in the headline stats, and you can get a good idea in terms of what they're about. Um, but, but again, if you have more time, like you do have going into a competition or it's only four rounds or it's a World Cup or whatever, then, you, then time is on your hands and you can spend as much time as you want to on it. But I think in terms of um, you, you, you want to just be careful on the, the balance of the time that you, you're not ignoring issues around team building. You're not ignoring issues about practicing your own execution. Um, the example I use, um, and I, I, I hope this um, gives you a better example. Maybe my answer, Callum, wasn't as, as clear as it should be, but I'm always fascinated by barbarians rugby because the barbarians rule is something different. You, you know, you'll gather this group of really good rugby players together. They'll fly into London. They're going to play England on the weekend. The Sunday night, they'll all meet and get their kit. Uh, the Monday morning, they'll probably have a team meeting and you know, introduce each other. Then they'll hit the golf course on Monday afternoon. A Tuesday, they'll go play touch together, you know, and they'll probably talk about like one star to move that they're going to have. Tuesday night will be a team building, so they'll be on the beers. They'll be pissed as fox. Wednesday, they'll recover. Thursday, they'll probably have a bit of a team run and have golf in the afternoon again because it's the bar bars and the team building. Friday, they'll have a captain's run. They probably won't even run a defensive set. Um, maybe if you've got a coach who's a bit of a nutter, he might show a little bit of England's players so you just get in your head. And then Saturday, they go out and they've probably got a good chance of winning the game because they're good enough rugby players and they've kept it simple. And there's no opposition analysis there because you're playing a Barbarians game. And, you know, the players will look at you as you're crazy if you start doing two hours of video analysis. So how come they can be successful, yet why do we do? And I keep challenging myself and all the coaches as to, you know, you've got to, you've got to understand why you do it. But, um, again, unfortunately, you know, when you're running a Barbars team, you're not under the pressure that you have to win because it's Barbars rugby. But the, the, the example is still relevant in terms of, well, if you were not to do opposition analysis and you were only to focus on yourself, on yourself and being the best team that you can possibly be, I wonder how much of the games you'll still probably win. I think you'll still probably win a high percentage of those. And that's the reason why, Callum, I'm warning against not spending too much time um, within the team environment of, on opposition analysis to the detriment of a good team building exercise, running a good training session, understanding and having clarity of what you guys are trying to do as a team fundamentally. So um, I don't have an actual number, but I think getting that balance right is, is particularly important. Um, I, I, I could definitely tell you that um, I've been in, in super rugby environments before where the defense coach, outstanding defense coach, really dedicated to his job, worked like an absolute Trojan, and opposition analysis video sessions were an hour and a half long. But he told you everything you needed to know about the opposition. I'm telling you, don't ask the players afterwards, you know, what was that move they did from a left-hand scrum and the guy goes, I don't know, this, that, that thing just went on for too long. So, um, again, you know, we can argue it as much as we want to. At the end of the day, go back to the players and find out what had the best effect on them being the best rugby players. And that's really where your answer lies. But I, I, don't, I, I don't know an actual percentage, but I hope I've been able to shed a bit of light for you on that. Yes, Matt, thanks for your thoughts on that. Bill? Wow. Awesome, Gary. It's uh, obviously going into that much detail. I think that the coaches you know, have really got a really good insight on, on how much is at that level, um, but also a lot of good takeaways around how we can take it down into all the various levels across the different people in this, in, in this chat as well. So it's been great to have you on, mate. Ando, did you want to close out? Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, once again, as I mentioned at the opening, very, very... Um, Again, you know, as was last week, very informative. Um, you've obviously, um, with the years of experience, I think you might have found the balance. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of chats off air about this, but 
it is a, a critical area. It's a critical aspect of, um, you know, your role as a coach. Uh, and it doesn't matter what level, whether it's a premier club level, whether it's at a national level. Um, I think we all agree um, that measuring performance is part and parcel of our role as a teacher, as you highlighted. Uh, yeah. Coaching is teaching. So you have to measure. Um, and whatever form that takes is very much dependent on the context and the environment that you actually operate in. I think that's the other critical aspect. So, and that ties in with the, you know, the use of the word balance that, that you um, spoke about before. Uh, but, but, but again, Gary, thanks for your preparation. We know how much time you've put in. Um, I think I'm stretching the friendship a little bit here, but um, no, it's thanks, a pleasure, and, uh, <laughs> thanks very <laughs> much. And, uh, um, I wish you all the best. I know you're in a really difficult situation uh, with USA Rugby. Uh, and, and obviously, as we've talked, if we can be of any help at all, mate, uh, let us know. Thank you very thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and, and well done to all of you for what you're doing for the game. So thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it and enjoyed meeting you all and seeing some old familiar faces and yeah, some legends. So to all of you who I do know, take care. And if I don't, stay safe. Thanks very much. Thank you, Gary. Um, and for those that are still online, we've lost a few. Um, next week, we have fitness integration. Um, obviously, sports-specific conditioning for rugby. Uh, same time next week. Dylan will update um, through the week. Um, and uh, we'll leave it there for now, and we'll, we'll see you all next week. Thanks again, Gary. Thanks, guys. All the Thanks, best. Gary. Thanks, coaches. Thank